Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. So we're talking about the fact that, you know, remember this? Okay, what, this is the covenant name of God. Remember? And then we got from here, we got... Um, one, put say, actually, I, I put the wrong letter in last week. We got Yahweh, and then, of course, the, uh, the German equivalent was, so we have J-H-V-H, Jehovah. These are the covenant names of God. Amen? So we're refreshing from last week. And then the one name that we were specifically talking about, Jehovah. What? Rapha. Again, Schofield says that the hyphenated names are an increasing self-revelation of God to humanity. Okay? It's revealing himself. So we have, here we are, we're talking about the covenant of God, the covenant name, Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord that healeth thee. Why? Because healing is a redemptive truth. It's in, it's in the plan of redemption. In the covenant that God cut with us in redemption, healing is included. All right? Now, now we know this because we talked about last week, God said, I'm, I'm the Lord, I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we have this. And then, you know, uh, let's look at in the Old Testament as um, in Numbers 21, 9. Um, think about this now. We're going to talk about Numbers 21, 9. And we're going to, we're going to bring in, so Numbers 21, 9. Okay, how this parallels, and of course, John 3, 14, and 15. And we'll, we'll tie these two together. Okay, let's first of all read John, uh, Numbers 21, 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And remember, remember what, why did he have to do this? Because God told them that when they sin, that, you know, the serpents would come out, the fire serpents would come out and bite the people, and they would die. And they began to cry out, and Moses says, now. And God tells Moses, says, look, take a, take a pole, put a fiery serpent or brass, bra bra brazen, brass serpent on it, and when you're bit, if you look at it, you'll live. Okay? And so we have here, and he, Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that the serpent bit, had bitten any man. When he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, let's bring that to New Covenant, New Testament. John 3.14. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what John does is he takes the brazen serpent of Numbers 21.9 and does what? Equates the serpent. Now, you've seen this on ambulances before. You know, you know the snake head. Okay, that's a terrible snake, but you, you get it, okay? All right? Go by any ambulance. And they'll have that logo, the, the serpent on a pole on it. Think about it. Here we have, in, in our secular society, using a biblical reference for healing. Okay? Isn't that funny? Now, I think it usually have kind of some kind of, you know, you know other st stuff in there. But there's, there's a serpent of brass up there. Or the, the, the serpent's up there. But, Bo, but John says... Of Jesus, that God said, you know, that He said here, as Moses lifted up the serpent, Jesus is quoting this, as, as John lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, I mean, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus is the brazen serpent. Now, under the old covenant, and then the new covenant, uh, the old has healing. If the new is a better covenant established on better promises, it has to have all the benefits of the old and then some. 
Amen? Jesus equated it when he said the Son of Man must be lifted up just like the brazen serpent was. So healing is included in the old, and healing is included in Jesus. We have Jesus saying, I'm just like the serpent in the wilderness, and they looked on that serpent when they were bitten by the snake and lived. Now, we can go into all the parallels there. We can take it to the parallel that they've been bitten by the serpent Satan, and if you look to Jesus, you'll be healed, I mean, saved. Okay, there's, there's, double, there's dual parallels here. But if you'll study the Word of God, you'll find throughout the Word of God that healing and salvation go hand in hand all the time. Let's look, for example, over to the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Okay, so healing, let's, let's, healing and let me, let me qu qualify this. Saving, that's a terrible, there we go, I'll oh, shorten that, there we go. Saving salvation, yeah, because we know the word, the sozo word group, Soterius, uh, I misspelled that, but yeah, it's the Greek, these are the Greek. This is the noun, this is the verb. Okay, all right, in the Greek. So the sozo word group, that word sozo, which soterius means salvation. I misspelled that. I'm sure I misspelled that. Um, but sozo, I got right. S-O-Z-O, it's not hard to mess up. It's on my license tag. That's how I remember all the time. Okay? <laughs> all right? The, so when I say saving, I mean getting born again. Okay? So healing and saving salvation are what? They are, Brother Hagin used to call it God's double cure. Cure, okay? Or they are partners in the plan of God. And as we look into certain scriptures, passages of scripture, Isaiah 53, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and then Matthew 8, 17, which we'll, we're going to get ready to read all these, we'll see how salvation and healing go hand in hand. Okay? As a matter of fact, let's throw another one in there just for the fun of it. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. Okay? So let's include that right in there. Do y'all mind me writing on the board? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, this is Isaiah 53 first, okay? And yeah, let me get there. I'm not there. I've been writing. See, one of my helpers should have come up and turned my Bible for me. No, you shouldn't have a mess with you now. Isaiah 53, 1. Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. <laughs> now let me say some. And, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Let me say something. Forget the macho metro look for getting the gospel out. Jesus, the Bible says about Jesus, there was no form nor comeliness we should desire him. There's no beauty in him. It wasn't because he was Mr. GQ, because he was, you know, he was a hunk hot. I mean, we get, we, the kids are talking about oh, some of these preachers now on television, they're, they're, they're wearing their t-shirts, they're, they're tight, you know, spandexy tight shirts to preach in, and they'll hold their arm a certain way, the microphone, to, to, so that when they hold the microphone, like, certainly it flexes and biceps so they can look like a stud while they're... It's disgusting. Jesus came and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Not because I can flex my bicep with my skin-tight spandex shirt on. The only people who will be following you is, is um, some of them ladies of the evening. Remember Larry Cable well, guy redid, um, um, it was the night before Christmas, when he got to the ho-ho-ho part, he said, Lady of the evening, lady of the evening, lady of the... You'll get it later. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Jesus wasn't like, you know, he wouldn't be on the cover of GQ. Because the Bible says so. What drew people to Jesus was not his bed head and his skinny jeans and his marketed look. What drew people to Jesus was the anointing of God that set the captives free. 
But we have substituted. Pastor Hagen used to say this and still says it. But I heard him say it years ago. He said, stop looking for the spectacular at the expense of the supernatural. He, he said a little bit different. Than that. Those are the two words he was using. I, I, you know, uh, he said, don't miss the supernatural looking for the spectacular. That's how he said it. Don't miss the supernatural looking for the spectacular. See, we want, we want the look. We want the groom. We want the market. We will be marketed properly. Let me tell you something. When people are dying of, of a disease, they don't care if you have bed head. They don't care if you can wear skinny jeans and still keep your voice three octaves below the, you know, uh, soprano. Okay? They want to know, have you got something supernatural to bring to the table that's going to liberate and set me free? Amen. Amen. So, healing and saving salvation, God's double cure. And says, there's no form of comeliness that we should desire him, no beauty that we should desire him. Listen, verse 3, he is despised and rejected of me and a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We, had, we hid as I were our faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our diseases. All right? Um, Surely it's more our, our griefs and carried our sorrows. I'm sorry, I, I quoted the, the Greek or the Hebrew. Yet he did, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, when we go back up here, surely it's more our griefs. Um, the word grief comes from the Hebrew koile. C-A, um, koile, okay. Um, here we go over here. C H O I L. Why? And it is translated in Brown, Driver, and Briggs, or Biggs, Concordance. Now, Strong's does, does extra, but this, this, of course, has it as sickness, and sickness only. Sorrows is from the Hebrew, Makab, and it means grief or pains. Okay. So, Pain. I, I'm sorry, not grief. It actually it literally means just pain. I'm sorry, but get so entrenched in, in historical teaching. It means pain. Okay? So let's read it this way. Surely hath borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was um, Wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And look at the end of chapter verse 5 in Isaiah chapter 53, and with his stripes we are healed. Why does it say we are healed? Because he's prophesying. Isaiah is looking to the future. Now when we get to 1 Peter 2.24, past or accomplished? First Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. We were healed. Isaiah 55, we are. First Peter 2, 24, we were. Isaiah, uh, so here we have it. First Isaiah 53, we, he's prophesying of a future coming event. What? Of the one who's, who's going to do what? Wounded for our transgressions. What's that? Sin. Bruised for our iniquities. So that is transgression and iniquities covering the sin. So who is doing this? Back up in verse 1. Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Amen. Actually, if you chapter 53 doesn't start in verse 1. It starts in verse 13 of the previous chapter. 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be extolled and exalted and be very high, as many were astonished at thee. His visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Jesus on the cross. So he sprinkled many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths on him. Which kings? Not talking about the kings of the earth. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Psalm 22. The kings of, of the demonic kingdoms. 
Okay? Shall shut their mouths him. For that which they had not seen shall be told them they see, and that which they shall have not heard they shall consider. But who's believed our report? Who has believed our report? See, this, this 53 continues out of those last three verses of chapter 52. It's talking about who? All this is in reference to Jesus. How do we know? Well, then we go to Matthew chapter 8. See, so we have Isaiah telling us that what? Transgressions and iniquities are carried by this coming suffering servant. First Peter 2.24 says, Whose own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. What does is, what is, uh, 1 Peter 2.24 tell us? Jesus bore our sin. But it also tells us in Isaiah 53 and in 1 Peter 2.24, he also carried our sicknesses. He carried our sin and sickness. He carried both. <clears throat> now I'm going to make a statement that, that, that hair lips a lot of people. It just upsets them. Are you ready? God thought it was just as important to take care of your physical body as he did your spiritual being because he used the same sacrifice to take care of both. <laughs> the same sacrifice was used. To take care of those. That messes up theology. That messes up theologi theological positions. That just messes folk up. But when we look at Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. And what? Forget not his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all all thy diseases. Here we go again. We got in Isaiah 53. We got in First Peter 2, 24. We have in Psalm 103, healing and forgiveness or salvation of your spirit going hand in hand. Why? Because God was going to send a suffering servant to take care of both at the same time. Hallelujah. That's enough to make a Pentecostal out of a Presbyterian. <laughs> Ain't it, Jeff? <laughs> Jeff, well, I know he's the only resident Presbyterian that I know of in here, so, or former. Oh, we got a Lutheran back there. All right. Let's well, see, it doesn't work. The P and the P work together, you know. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, you know, people come along and say, well, when Peter, it says, it says first Peter is talking about the spiritual sickness of sin. No. And this is why we go to Matthew chapter 8. Okay. What you all know last week when I kind of started using the board, it was just kind of a quirk. But then it was so good, you know, it's like, wow, well, it is Bible study. You know, <laughs> so, all right, Matthew 8, verse, uh, 17, 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. <laughs> that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet himself, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So Matthew chapter 8, verses really 16 and 17, declares that the reference in Isaiah is of, of concerning sickness, him taking our sicknesses, is physical. And then Peter quotes Isaiah 53 and declares it an accomplished fact. In what? Redemption. Jesus redeemed us in his work at the cross, in his death, his burial, his resurrection in redeeming us to the Father. Hallelujah. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. The sacrifice of Jesus was used to get to deliver us from sin and to heal our bodies. 
Matthew does away with the spiritual sickness of sin teaching by clearly saying it was sicknesses, and then he referred to Isaiah 53 when he said it. With the, therefore, validates First Peter 2.24 as referring to he, see, uh, taking care of our sin and healing us of physical sicknesses. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, can I say something? I should have done this a long time ago. I'm seeing light bulbs go off, and I taught this, I don't know how many times over the years. The light bulbs are going off. Wow. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Okay. Well, I don't really consider myself a bored kind of guy, but hallelujah. Okay. It, now, anybody, you can get any evangelical, even, even liturgical, and they will decree that, sin, that, that forgiveness of sin is a redemptive truth. It's part of redemption. You, you just, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Yet we see here in these passages, physical healing and forgiveness coupled to, are coupled together as a benefit of God. Thus we may determine that the benefits of God are in association with redemption, for one has only to quickly glance at the 103rd Psalm to find, <coughs> to find that it was written to people who keep his covenant. In essence, the redeemed. Let us consider the ministry of Jesus. Jesus made it clear that his ministry was not his own. Remember, we talked about this last week. I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent. Well, actually, we talked about that Sunday in, in reference to using the name of Jesus, you know, and that, that kind of thing. Okay? Um, John 6, 38. I came down from heaven not to do my will. Okay? John 6, 38. I'm going to try to find a place for you. John 6, 30, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. John 14, 9. And 14, 9 through 11. Jesus said, I've, have I been so long with you? Remember, Philip said, show us the Father that is sufficient for us. And Peter said, Jesus says, have I been so long with you? And you've not known me? Philip? He that's seen me, seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Believest thou not, I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now Jesus makes it clear. Okay, we, we've got all this, right? The, the, you know, Yahweh, Jehovah, I need some room. Okay, we, we, listen, we had this one last I just put it up there for, for a little extra reminder. Okay. When Jesus, when Jesus said that, he said, whatever I was doing is the will of the Father. I'm going to be, I, no, I could get a little honorary here. How many times did you see Jesus make somebody sick just walked up to somebody who was sitting on the side of the road, minding their business, not doing anything, and he came out, uh, I'm putting sickness on you to teach you a lesson. Never. Really? We don't have any, if Jesus was carrying, now listen, if Jesus was carrying out the will of the Father according to a lot of church teaching today, he would have made more people sick than he did healed. Now think about it. Think about it. You got people. Well, you know, God, God has a reason that you're sick. God put, you know, God put that on you to teach you a lesson. And say, the, a lot of people I know that, that got something that God gave them to teach them a lesson, they died not ever getting the lesson. If, I'm going, to, I'm going to say this one more time. If, Jesus was doing the will of the Father according to the teaching of the church today. He'd have made more people sick than he healed. How many people do you know that believe God's teaching them something or put something on them that are sick and die or waste away with it versus how many actually get healed? And it's because the church has, ta has not taught this as a whole. They teach... Now, listen, I was, listening, I was, I was watching... Um, the major, biggest Christian television network on the planet a number of years ago. And they had a well-known evangelist on there. I won't call his name. 
you know. But he's on there, and boy, he preached a salvation message. I'm telling you, I don't care if you're a gutter snipe. I don't care if you're a prostitute. I don't care what you've mur if you've murdered somebody. God's grace and God's mercy, the blood of Jesus is enough to redeem you and to bring you in. And the phone banks lit up and they're getting stacks of salvation cards. And I mean, he just preaches for, I mean, about how Jesus saves you and he loves you and it doesn't matter what you've done. You know, and da 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 da. -da. And he was, he was doing that out of Psalm 103. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. I mean, lighting up the phone banks, they're writing salvation, they're bringing stacks out. People, I guess they're sitting in bars getting saved, they're sitting all over the place getting saved because he's preaching that salvation message. Glory to God. Thank God for the salvation message that Jesus is Lord. You can be born again. And then after it all it kind of wound down, you know, and the phone stopped ringing, you know, he's going to go ahead and finish his sermon. You know, his little talk, he sits there and looks over at the, the, looks over at the host and says, well, you know, brother, so-and-so, Let's read the rest of that verse. Who healeth all thy diseases. And he looks, he, he gets on his real religious posture. The anointing packed up and left the room right then. And looks at him and he says, you know, all don't always mean all. Sometimes God doesn't heal. And I'm screaming at the television. What do you mean it doesn't always mean all? Oh. What he just did is he undid his previous sermon. Anybody that was in the balance at that time, the devil came and sat right on their shoulder and said, No, see, you're, you're one of those that doesn't include all your iniquities. Because if it doesn't include all your iniquities, it doesn't include all your, if it doesn't include all your diseases, it doesn't include all your iniquities. It was, a, I said, oh, there's a semicolon there. The power of the semicolon. To completely alter the meaning of a word. That word being all. Who forgiveth all your iniquities, who healeth all your diseases. All of a sudden, when it got to a place where they theologically had a problem, all didn't mean all. Because they had experienced someone not getting healed. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. How many sermons have you preached in a church on getting saved that people didn't get saved? You take that same person, sit them down, and ask them, Did it, was, was God willing to save everybody in that room? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, folks didn't get saved. My experience tells me that means that God didn't want to save everybody. That's what they did with healing. Because they knew people who didn't receive for whatever reason. Then they equated that being God must will that they not be saved. But if you do that on who healeth all your diseases, you got to go right back and say, well, it's not God's will to save everybody then. Because all means all means all of those verses. Okay? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. Matthew 8. Look, look at this real, real interesting. This is, a real cool, this is really cool to me. Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogue. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Look at me. He has a problem. What's his problem? He knows, he can. He doesn't know if, oh brother, if he is willing. That is, that's what, what is keeping him from his answer at this moment is not believing God can. Oh, yeah. You can get an atheist. Well, if God is God, he could. If there is a God, I guess he could. So here we have this man. He knows that Jesus can, 
But the problem is not knowing that God can. Is, is He willing? There is His problem. Because until He knows the will of God, He cannot be in faith. Because where does faith begin? Where the will of God is known. That's where faith begins. Where the will of God is known. When you know the will of God, you can be in faith. This man comes, man, that's Jesus. He can. Man, I know he can. So his question is not, Lord, do you have the power to heal me? Because we've got a lot of people, man, if I could, if I could, heal, think about this. We have humanity going, if I could, I would. If they could take and go to a hospital and get some little kid dying of leukemia healed, they would. If they had the power to do it and, 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 they, and, and it was resident with them to do it, they would go do it. And here we got people in the church knowing that God can any time, any place, any way He wants to, He can. They question His willingness. And I said, that's a slap in the face of God. It'd be better for him to want to and couldn't do it than to be able to do it and not want to. So the man comes to Jesus and said, he worshiped him. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. I, I took the King Jimmy out and brought it up today. And Jesus puts forth his hand, touching him. And what did Jesus say? Remember, Jesus said, I am the, I am the representative of the Father. What you see me do, I only do it because I'm do, seeing the Father do it. And the first thing out of Jesus' mouth is, I will. Why? He had to take care of the knowledge problem. He had to get him to know the will of God so that he could be in faith. He got him from the place of not knowing the will, stretched it forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Man, the minute the guy knew it was his will, he, he was ready, he could receive. The only thing standing between him and his miracle was the knowledge of the will of God. This pastor. So where the will of God is known, there's faith. The man came, he knew Jesus could. He didn't know if he was willing. And then Jesus took care of his knowledge problem. I will be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Immediately. Can somebody shout glory? glory. Hallelujah. The leper knew Jesus had the power. He questioned his willingness. And boy, is that the state of the church today? I, I, I've heard preachers on television and radio. We know that God can gloriously heal. That's, any bozo can figure that one out. If he's God, he can do anything. My God can do anything, anything, oh, anything. My God can do anything. Right, we believe God can. But until we move from the I know he can to the I know he will, we can't get into faith and we can't receive. And the only way we're going to get it is for people to teach what the Bible says about the subject. Without this knowledge, you can't know the will of God. And Jesus said, I came to do the will of him that sent me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what did Jesus do? 
He went round about their villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. They found that in Matthew 4.23, and we find a, re a re rehearsing of that same scripture again in Matthew 9.35. Matthew 4.23 and Matthew 9.35. Round about their villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, hitting all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, he healed just to prove he was God. The Bible says he did it because he, he was watching the Father. Jesus didn't have to prove his deity. More so, Jesus actually came to prove that a man with the life of God in him could honor the Father and walk above the world system of sin and defeat. He didn't do it as God. He did it as a man under the co under a covenant. And see, you as a child of God can do the same thing. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.